Great. Thanks, Gary. Okay. Well, um, what does my lab do? Gosh, I think that you can tell by the number of associations I have that, that I spend my time just accruing affiliations. It's probably true in science as well. I accrue new things to work on. This is one of my major thrusts, though, not this particular project, although that's certainly a major issue, but the idea of synthetic biology, which I'll talk about more in a minute. But what I'm probably best known for is what's called systems biology. And um, before I describe what that is, I do want to give credit up front for the person who actually did this work. Most of this work, almost all of it, has been done by uh, Christopher Anderson, who's a, a Damon Runyon scholar in my group and the group of Christopher Voigt, former postdoc of mine, who's now at UCSF as a professor who's been chewing up the charts himself. Um, it's interesting. You know, he's a chemist, chemical engineer. I'm a physical chemist, and we're doing biology. And that's sort of where we stand these days. We're sort of all converging on trying to apply different technologies to how biology works. So in general, what my lab works on, if I had to put it into a single umbrella, is design principles of cells. How, and, and uh, biologists don't like hearing that word, because first of all, it, things like intelligent design pop up. I don't mean that. I mean, evolution has had 3.5 billion years to, by random chance and selection, evolve a bacterium. And bacterium, bacteria, of course, uh, are, are, have a very uh, fast cell cycle, generally, not in the, in the outside world, but they can evolve very rapidly and are pretty much optimal. And so there must be some design to the way that they are put together. And I'm interested in discovering what those principles are and then exploiting them so that I can build my own things uh, in the world. And the example I'm going to use today is the design of a bacterium whose sole job in life is to act as a pathogen for cancer. Now, of course, cancer is you, and so there's some danger that it might mis make a mistake. And the whole job here is to prevent that from happening and to make it very specific. But when I do think about how to understand the design of cells, I really think about, about it this way. Anytime I think of an organism that I'm going to be working with, whether I'm going to try to reverse engineer its behaviors and its designs, or trying to forward engineer its behaviors and designs, I'm thinking about what its design goals are. And this is an example of a tiny ecology, uh, picked out of a much larger one, of a human immune cell, which is trying to eat a bacterium there. And uh, this bacterium is trying to invade or perhaps escape this, uh, this, this cell. It itself is under attack, both by the immune cell and by its own viruses. And of course, here's HIV, a cartoon of HIV trying to attack that immune cell. And so there's this game being played amongst these different organisms in the world and cell types in the world, and the game is to survive. And what you find is that there are winners and there are losers and there are guys who are just staying in the game, like anything else. So when we talk about the design of networks, we're going to design for this game in some sense. That's a sort of an engineering way of looking at the problem. To understand this, we have to understand the underlying cellular biophysics inside these cells. We have to understand the population biology and select and 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 interactions amongst the different cellular different uh, cellular players and organismal players. And we have to understand population biology and evolution. And this is the source of of my desire or drive towards dilettantism. I need to I want to understand each one of these areas in some detail so that I could put it together into a coherent story. And this, of course, means that I'm a bit broad sometimes. So synthetic biology is what I really came to talk about today, and I'm going to define it here. Um, why is synthetic biology different than genetic engineering? Well, it, it isn't. It's, 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 it's genetic engineering 2.0, if you want to use the web lingo. The idea is that we know how to change cells. We know how to change DNA now, and people have been doing it for years. Whole pathways have been engineered. Plants have been engineered who turn on pesticides when, when bugs bite them. I mean, real synthetic biology applications. 80% of our soybean crops have more than two genes genetically engineered into them. 80% of our soybean crops in the United States. This isn't a new thing to want to engineer life for application. The idea, though, is that up until this time, it has been one-offs. That people who did this kind of tinkered with it and put in the things they needed and tinkered with it until it worked. So it's like someone who has a good feel for how a car works getting in and be trying to tune it up and making things like that happen. What we're trying to do is move it into a more scalable science. And so synthetic biology is really the science of developing the standards, the abstractions, the characterization protocols, and the parts lists to make uh, genetic engineering of new complex biological functions cheaper, faster, scalable, and reliable. 
I would also argue that to date, the major engineering feats in biology have been towards production of a chemical. Whether it be production of a pesticide in a plant, or drought resistance in a plant, or the production of anti-malarial drugs by E. coli, it is a production problem. When we talk about doing more sophisticated things, and perhaps that's, that's, that's the wrong thing to say, but doing things which are more reactive, like trying to design a bacteria which knows where it is, implements a program, and builds a series of staged responses to its environment, we have to be much surer of our engineering designs than just simply optimizing an output. Now, there's been a new engineering research center, NSF Engineering Research Center, which was recently granted to Berkeley, UCSF, MIT, Harvard, and Prairie View University, um, called SINBERC, which is a, a, has a 10-year plan to try to make this into something which is a more scalable science than it is right now. This is being led by Jay Keesling and Wendell Lim, actually. So why did I choose this particular problem? So I chose this problem, the tumor-killing bacterium, mostly because uh, this guy over here, Chris Anderson, came to my office one night after we had recruited him to the lab, and he said, you're not giving me crazy enough projects. Give me something which is absolutely absurd that I can do in, in a few years' time. And we thought, well, I didn't know really what I wanted to do. I thought maybe a tumor-killing bacteria would be cool. This guy was very talented. He, de he designed with Pete Schultz, who used to be here, the four-base codon. Uh, as you might know that most, uh, mo the genetic code is made up of three base codons, which encode 20 amino acids. By making a four base codon, you can encode many more amino acids and make the organism more versatile. He also encoded, made an E. coli which could incorporate more than, one, more, more than 20 amino acids, and so it was pretty cool. He could do the type of thing. The other reason I liked tumor killing bacteria was it was a complex specification, it had a staged program. It required sensor fusion, meaning multiple sensing uh, th things that had to sense fuse and make decisions on. And it was a staged and modular program, as I'll tell you. The reliability was critical, obviously. We had to make sure it was safe and that it did exactly what we told it to do and nothing else, and that when it failed, it failed properly. And it was a critical application, and there was an objective metric of success. You know, it, it was, if you cured cancer, you won. Okay, it's a bit, bit of a crazy metric, but there you are. There's other things it also provided. I'm releasing this organism into the world, and in fact, into your world. Unlike the anti-malarial producing bacteria, which is kept in a bioreactor and can be contained, this is going to be inside you. Now, that has its own issues that we can all feel, you know, squiggly about, but it can also have the fact that it can interact with all your cells and all the bacteria and fungi and other things that make up your body. Remember, in terms of cell count, you're mostly bacteria. So, and these guys are very promiscuous with their DNA. And so we have to be, think about how is this thing going to evolve? What's, this going to be, what's going to be selected out of it? How is it going to exchange DNA with the outside, and how can we prevent that? So as a test bed for challenging all the central precepts of an engineering science and synthetic biology, it provided a core, beautiful example of something to work on. Very ambitious, and, and so on. It also allowed us to make you know, little pieces that we could get published you know, in between. <laughs> It's a good thing to have in a science project. So what's the idea? Well, most smart drugs follow this sort of idea. Not all of them, but most of them. So this is an idea, an idea of a smart liposome. You have some sort of liposome or dendromer or something, which is kind of uh, an organic molecule of some sort that can hold a package of drug of some sort, which can be converted to a real drug at the site of action, perhaps. And outside of this thing, there are recognition sites. That is, you can add to the, to the outside of this lipid vesicle molecules that bind specifically to markers that are appear on the outside of your target cell. So in cancer cells, for example, they can express, overexpress certain proteins on their surface. And if these things bound to those pieces, they could bind to it, fuse to the cell membrane, dump their kill, and it would be, you know, be pretty good. And they work OK. Not great. Haven't been the, the panacea we'd all hoped. And there are a lot of reasons why that is, but more, more, part of its delivery, part of its specificity, part of it, there's no site of action. You can't make decisions here. It's just, you know, what it is. It's going to bind and, 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 and dump. And our idea was that a bacterium can have hundreds of environmental sensors stuck on its surface, if not thousands, at least hundreds of different ones. They have appendages designed for specific binding. So pili and other adhesins that these guys can make that I can engineer so they can recognize specific entities. And this signal of binding can be transmitted into the cell and operated upon by a logic and communication system driven by DNA and protein and metabolism. 
And then on command, this thing can change its state, including synthesizing a drug like the antimalarial, for example, and delivering it. This is a type 3 secretion system by puncturing the, the target cell and actually dumping the protein into the medium, or the, or the organic into the medium. And of course, they have motility systems and other actuation systems that we can play with. So this is a compact sensor signal processor actuation package. The other cool thing about it, of course, is it's been evolved to live inside of us. As I said, most of our cells in this package are bacteria. So they already live there. Now, of course, the scope of, of, of synthetic biology is, is beyond this sort of thing. There's, of course, production of therapeutics and specialty chemicals. There's bioremediation agents. In another part of my life, we do bioremediation work. Uh, there's compact nanoscale sensor controller actuator packages for doing all sorts of crazy things. Homa Helenga at Duke has made a TNT sensor out of an E. coli, for example, for explosive sensing. They're highly engineerable. They are self-assembling and self-replicating and therefore cheap. And they're derived from cheap renewable resources. Okay, now, when we came up with this project, I thought I was pretty clever. And as I'll show you later, I, I wasn't as clever as I thought I was. But who, who can guess what these things are here? What are these diagrams showing? Acupuncture. That's what everyone says. It's funny. That's, I've been I've given this talk a number of times. Acupuncture. Actually, it's not. It's the sites at which you place a leech to treat certain diseases. <laughs> the first... <laughs> since the ancient Greeks, <laughs> leeches and the like, live organisms have been used for their evolutionary adaptability to treat illness. They're actually used today. Um, now, no one in this room has mentioned it, but everyone else at Harvard was really fascinated with the fact that there's a lot of sites down over there. <laughs> okay. So the leech is very nifty in that it, it has a lot of things you'd want. It has a mouth part that is well-defined. It sucks right on the site of action. It secretes anticoagulants to prevent the wound from, from clotting. And it can indeed process a whole bunch of pomers. They're actually used to drain hemat hematobas from wounds. Uh, there's a, everyone who knows uh, British comedy knows Black Adder. So Black Adder says, I've never had anything you doctors didn't try to cure as leeches. A leech on my ear for my earache, a leech on my bottom for constipation. They're marvelous, aren't they, says the doctor. And that really is the case. These are actually a biomedical device. These are actually the, an FDA-approved medical device. They're maggots. Maggots are used and have been used for a very, very long time uh, to clean wounds. Uh, maggots are really nifty. They're, so this is a blowfly maggot, this family uh, Califordiae. They lay their eggs exclusively in dead or rotting flesh. That's where I like to be. In fact, the first thing that gets to you when you die, one of these guys. And you can actually use it forensically to, to, uh, by, by looking at the egg hatchings about when that person died. It's used for forensics to, to, to make the time of death. But most importantly right now for health is that it's used to debride wounds when it makes the wounds heal cleaner and faster. So if you get a really serious wound, they'll put maggots in it to clean the edges, make it nice and it will reheal in a much cleaner way. This, these are both examples of medical devices that have been approved by the FDA. They're live medical devices, and they're used because evolutionarily, they are designed to do this work. They have all the features you'd want to make this happen. So why not bacteria? Well, we weren't the first people to notice that bacteria had therapeutic fa factors. As far back as 1700s, it was observed that in certain cancer patients, they developed a concurrent infection. Of course, they didn't know it was bacteria at the time. Uh, that would have concomitant or regret, regret, regression of the malignancy. That means that the patients who got cancer would get some infection, which they could see, and then the tumor would go away. The first patient with cancer to be purposely infected with bacteria was probably this uh, German physician, uh, W. Bush, in 1868. This is, this is pre-Pasteur. 1871 is when Pasteur began to really use these guys for various things. What he had is he had two patients sitting in a room. One was a, one was a guy who was dying of a wasting infection. It ended up being Streptococcus pyrogenes, of all things, a nice wasting bacterium. And the woman next door had an inoperable throat sarcoma, a big overgrowth of cells on her throat. And it was absolutely awful. So he got, got his lot to look at this poor guy who's wasting away and this big overgrowth of cells and goes, aha. So the guy who has streptococcus progenies dies. So he takes this woman, cuts open her throat sarcoma, cauterizes it, and then places her in the bedding occupied by the guy who died of streptococcus pyrogenes. And damn, the tumor didn't go away. And then she died of streptococcus pyrogenes, <laughs> among other things. 
30 years later, uh, William Coley was actually a New York hospital uh, doctor. He got a patient with cancer who seemed to be cured by, uh, by, this, by a severe uh, infection of the same sort of bug, more or less. And, as, and over time, tried to use the bacteria to treat the wound. And, and what happened was that every time, he'd get, re he'd get regression of the tumor and death of the patient by other complicating factors of the infection, among other things. And he ended up being one of the first people to do chemotherapy because he actually isolated the toxin from the streptococcus and from the other uh, infecting bacteria and was able to use that as a pure chemical to try to treat the tumor. And then chemotherapy occurred. Now, a hundred years later, we are in the same boat. There's been a lot of advances in using live organisms to do things of use to therapy. This has been gene therapy. Suicide listeria have been used to deliver plasmas to macrophage genomes. There are live vaccines for Shigella, uh, cholera, hepatitis, and salmonella. So salmonella has been used to directly deliver peptide into immune cells. There's actually one FDA-approved bacterial treatment for cancer. I didn't know about this when I thought about this project. And this was uh, Mycobacterium bovis. It's a cousin of tuberculosis. And what's neat about it is that you can inject it into the bladder and it insists on the bladder wall. And it can be engineered and it itself does this, recruits um, macrophage to the bladder and increases cytotoxicity towards the tumor. And it has an 85% success rate, one of the highest in cancer therapies. So proof of principles exist. These can happen. There have been a number of trials in, in, uh, in using bacteria to treat tumors. Uh, there's been a salmonella tr uh, treatment, uh, which went into phase one. This is a live bacteria, IV administered. Um, it had a single gene knockout to remove uh, some, some uh, immune effects. And the patients didn't like it all that much. They got very sick. These are all pathogens. Now, it turns out that lots of bacteria localize to tumors. There's this wonderful experiment by you et al. in 2004. You take this, this little mouse here and you inject into its tail vein a whole bunch of bacteria expressing luciferase, which is a, a glowing protein in this case. And using an imaging box, you can see that in 20 minutes, the bacteria is nearly everywhere in this poor little mouse. But within two days, it's localized to a tumor that's on the, on the leg. And in fact, it's three orders of magnitude more dense, more populous in the tumor than anywhere else. And all these types of bacteria do it, including this sort of blank commensal bacteria, E. coli, DH5-alpha. So this is a natural thing for bacteria to, to invade these tumors or end up in the tumors. Not all of them do anything to the tumor. They grow there because the tumor center is immunocompromised. It's a little bit anoxic, which bacteria like. It's high in nutrition because there's necrotic cells there, and they don't get swept away by the bloodstream. So it's a pretty nifty thing. But the problem is, is that to get to doses that have effect on humans, you get very big side effects from the bacteria themselves. So the question is, is can we start with a blank commensal bacterium, one that lives in you with no problem, that we modify slightly so that it, or more than slightly, so that it doesn't evoke an immune response, but that it does know when it's in a tumor and then invade, a toxic, invade cells and dump kill. So why bacteria? Well, they're compact and engineerable, as I said. They're evolved for operation. They localize to the tumors under some conditions. They're easier to clear than viruses. There's a lot of viral therapies out there, but they're harder to clear. Um, uh, I can use antibiotics to clear a bacterium, but you guys know there isn't like a, a really good treatment for flu, for example, right? or HIV for that matter, <laughs> right? Um, so, uh, and also they, they, they can incorporate a lot more DNA than a virus can, so a lot more complicated behaviors than a virus can. Um, but most of the bacteria that people have been using up to date have been pathogens and they are toxic. So that's what we're going to do. So what distinguishes different bacteria? So we're going to start off with a bacterium that's pretty blank, but why are some guys pathogens and some not? So these are two examples of very closely related bacteria. E. coli K12 and Salmonella typhimerium are on the order of 96% identical on the sequence level for the genes they have in common. But in the lab strain E. coli, the only sort of virulence factor they really have are these things called type 1 pili that allow it to adhere to you and invade cells. But Salmonella has four adhesion systems. It has two type 3 secretion systems for pumping endotoxin into you. It has a bunch of antigen, O antigen, which is a lipid surface it puts on its cell that allow it to evade the immune system. 
It has uh, flagella for swimming where it needs to swim. And it has, very importantly, this iron acquisition system that allows it to grow in, the, in, in your body. It needs iron to grow. And to keep color K-12 has a hard time doing that. So there, there, there are these system, systematic modular differences between non-pathogenic bacteria and pathogenic bacteria. And we can pick and choose which ones we want and put them under our control versus the ones that are naturally evolved. So how are we going to specify the design here? Now, obviously, this is a fairly complicated design, and we're only at the very beginning of making this thing. So I'm going to give you some initial thoughts as opposed to our entire design, which is large. So imagine you have this guy sitting here. He's sort of like that guy there. And he has what looks like a heart, but is actually a tumor, sort of underneath his arm there. We need to avoid the innate immune response, which means we have to avoid sepsis. We have to avoid a common mediated killing and, macro, and macrophage. So these are, you have an innate and a, an adaptive immune system. Both these systems are triggered by bacterial components. And we want to make sure that that doesn't happen, because if it does, you will eat yourself, let alone our bacterium, which we want to maintain alive long enough to find the tumor. We want to find the tumor, and we're going to find the tumor by looking at microenvironmental cues that are specific to the tumor. Now, as you might imagine, there isn't just one. If you take any one marker, you'll find that same marker somewhere else in your body. So you want to combine a number of markers. These are a few examples that, that tumors tend to be hypoxic. They have low glucose, low pH, high lactate, and high nutrients, for example, compared to the blood or other tissue. We want to be able to selectively invade cancer cells, and we can do that by sensing things on their surface, like antigens, um, for example. And when we're inside this, when, we're, when we, when we, in, when we uh, invade the cancer cells, we're going to spread, we can either kill or spread within the tumors by using uh, listeria lysin to escape the vacuole and other things to cause apoptosis or alter chromatin or other things. So we have a bunch of environments we have to engineer for, right? We have the bloodstream, we have the tumor itself, we have the cell surface, and we have the intracellular environment. Now, obviously, we also have other things, other tissues we haven't discussed, but those are the major areas we're looking at. And people have spent a lot of time measuring differences between what's in the tumor and what's outside. So we know that in the bloodstream, it's characterized by high glucose, high oxygen, low lactate. In the tumor, I just told you what that was. In the cell surface, we have these, these antigens. And in the intracellular component, we have metabolites and pH differences that are indicative of being inside a cell. So we need to be able to sense these things. We need to actuate based on what we sense. So in the bloodstream, we're going to need shielding against the immune system, and we need to prevent ourselves from growing. We don't want to grow in the blood. That would be a bad thing. You'd end up clog clogging yourself up, even if you didn't get an immune response, which we can't completely destroy anyway. In the tumor, we need to activate uh, our program to invade. We have to de-shield our, our immune system avoidance. And again, we don't want any growth. That would be, again, not so good to have growing cells because they can escape the tumor and get out. We have the cell surface. We need to get adhesion to work. We need secretion of, of, of chemicals, perhaps, invasion into the cell. And again, no growth. But inside the cell, we're allowed to grow. We can lyse the cell, and we can kill the cell, all things we can do. So we have the sensing. We have the actuation. In between, there has to be some single processing. So here's our sensors. We need sensors for these, these sorts of things here. We need uh, logic gates and filters and switches. And we need these actuations, actuation systems. So here's a very simple example of a partial, of part of the design. To deal with the immune system, we're going to make this O antigen on the surface. This is going to be lipid code, uh, o, uh, o, K capsule and, and, and O capsule are examples. And that's going to be our deploy capsular shield and, it's in the, and, and to stop growth. So we're going to stop iron acquisition and we're going to make this lipid. We're only going to do it when certain conditions are met. And the simplest example of a, sig a signal integrator is an AND gate. Well, not the simplest, but one of the simplest is an AND gate, which says only when we have high glucose and high oxygen will I actually do this thing. Otherwise, I will not. Now, these are good markers of being in the blood. Being in the... Uh, being in the tumor means low oxygen and high bacterial density. So I can use another AND gate. In this case, it's called a suppressor AND gate I'll talk about in a minute. Um, that will drop our shield uh, and cause cell adhesion and invasion. And then we're in the vacuolar environment. We have some function here, probably uh, just, a, just a step function that says, if something is met that is only found in the vacuole, then escape the vacuole and deliver the therapeutic. So these are our three very simple parts. They're a very simple, simple program to do this. 
So before we begin trying to design these things, although we're going to do things this in parallel, we want to ask what are the most important parameters here to get maximum therapeutic output. Now, there's many, many things we could look at. I'm going to show you one, one small model that shows how we uh, determine whether or not we should do invasion of tumor cells, or whether or not we should, we should secrete the drug in the tumor environment but not inside the cells. What, which is better? And what are the most important things in terms of, of, of specificity? So you want to maximize delivery to the tumor and minimum survival in the serum or other tissue of our bacterium. So make this model of bacterial growth. This is an example. We have many different models, different scales. This is an example of what's called a population model. We're not going into the molecular mechanisms. We do have models for themselves. This is just how does the population work as it moves in the blood. So you can see that there's a bunch of things here. We have a blood population of bacteria, an other tissue population of bacteria, and a, and a tumor population of bacteria. And initially, we're not going to do invasion. We're just going to drop our kill in the environment of the, of the tumor. Each one of these equations is made up of a number of different terms. For example, growth in the blood, phage we need to kill, so macrophage can come in and eat, eat, our, eat, our, uh, eat our bacteria in the blood. They can be, they can be recognized by the complement system and killed. They can be transported to and from other tissue. They can be transported to and from the tumor, for example. And so these are sort of in, in, you know, simple initial value, uh, initial value differential equations, ordinary differential equations. Um, you can also get figure cytosine in other tissue, and of course you can get um, figure cytosine in the tumor. So these are other processes that can occur. Now, we don't know all the parameters of these equations. We have to do parametric analyses. Now, some of these things have been measured. And this model that, we, that I just showed you there has been, uh, a large fraction of it has been validated by other groups in, in its uh, ability to predict the distribution of bacteria in a mouse, not in a human. And uh, some of those parameters have been measured, some of them have not. So two of them that have, been not, that have not been measured is there's transport parameters that we can control. For example, transport to and from other tissue, or to from the tumor in this case, on this axis, and how, how uh, strong how many killing is. So this is a proxy for how protecting our shield is when we put up this O-antigen shield. And we have two different curves here. The blue curve is the distribution of bacteria in the blood as a function of these two, per, in, the, in the tumor, as a function of these activities. So this would be a very good distribution of bacteria in the tumor, and that means no transport out of the tumor and no killing of the bacterium. You get lots of activity. The problem is, is that this green curve, this sort of green histogram you see here, is the amount of bacteria in other tissue and in blood. And what you're seeing is that if, we, if we're trying to optimize one, we're also optimizing the other, making a lot of bacteria in other tissue and in the blood, and that's bad. So this is not a good, robust design, for example. On the other hand, if we just add an invasion, so we're going, to allow our, we're going to allow the tumor cells almost to be a sink for our bacteria so they can walk in, uh, we can find that there are regions of, this, of, this, um, of these curves. Here we have tumor transfer and invasion and common mediated killing and growth. There are regions of the parameter space where I can get very robust um, delivery of cytoplasmic bacteria without there being any growth in tissue and blood. So, that's, so we know that what we need to be able to do here is saying, well, OK, we need a good high invasion. We need very low growth, zero growth. We can need as low killing as we possibly can. And of course, everything else, this we can't control. So we really want to push things out, down, out here on this axis and out there on that axis. And so we think we can do that by using a very efficient invasion system and by using a very fi efficient complement system and dealing with iron resistance here. Now, one thing that we haven't dealt with in this design, and I won't talk about today because it's a little bit tricky, is the fact that when we put these bacteria even into a cell culture, which is not even in us, and we let them s try to propagate themselves over time, over time, just because of the natural cellular processes, there's a mutation going on. And those mutations can affect gene function, and oftentimes it can make them fail. And this is a small simulation here, which is actually based on a different circuit designed by Ron Weiss and Francis Arnold, which shows that, that even if the if this small mutant is slightly more advantageous for growth than, the other, than, than, our, than our wild type, then within a short period of time, this is the time the majority of our mutant, uh, you can very rapidly get, get um, uh, in just a few days, the mutant selected and your function's gone. So, one of the things that differs between synthetic biological engineering and other types of engineering 
is that our systems evolve and grow. And because they're evolving in real time, you have to design for those soft failures. And uh, that's one of the major challenges in our area today is, is those error-tolerant designs. So let's go back to our design scheme here and just go through how we actually build one of these things to get some sense in your hands, how do we build something like this. So here's the start of the, pro the parts list. Let's talk about the complement mediated AND gate. So, uh, and growth restriction, these are two things. We need to deal with, with uh, growth, stopping growth, and deploying the capsular shield, and we need an AND gate to do this. So first things first is we happen to know a lot about growth of bacteria in blood, and what they need most from us is iron. If they get iron, then they can grow much, very, very well. And they get iron from these blood proteins, ferritin, transferrin, heme, and lactoferrin. And they do that by secreting siderophores that bind to iron and are transported into the cell, and they can use it. We happen to know from genetic studies that these are the common transporters. Uh, are a common uh, um, uh, uh, siderophore producers, and these are the transporters, TAN B as being the major one. And if you knock out TAN B, these cells are static. They can't grow. On the other hand, they can still express genes and do other things. They just can't grow. Um, there's also low affinity iron transport I won't discuss today. This is the major thing we want to work on, TAN B. Um, just to give some sense of, of, of our growth restriction and how, whoops, how well it works, uh, this is just an example of, of a wild type exposed to serum and serum plus hemin, which is the iron-carrying protein that's in blood. And you see it doesn't grow in just plain old serum, but if you add hemin to it, wild type grows just fine. Whereas in our Tan B mutant, adding hemin really doesn't do anything. They're really just static. They're not growing at all. And you can show this at a... One of the things that I study in great detail is, is heterogeneity, how homogeneous is the response in the population. And because of basic biophysical principles, Lots of processes in bacteria and other cells are stochastic and random. And the only thing I'm showing here is that, you know, if you take, if you, this is, uh, this is the green curve is, the, is, is background cells, the blue curve is our, 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 um, our, our engineered cells. And what we're showing here is the number of cells with a certain um, amount of, of GFP expressed as a function of iron restriction. And the point here is that, is that as you, uh, unless you have both hemin and Tom B, so if your bacteria has Tan B and you have human in the media, you don't, you don't really get a lot of growth. This is where, where this is the number of cells increase radically when you have those two present. In complement resistance, that is, if we're going to actually now resist the immune system, we can make a lipid coat to our bacterium, so our bacterium's in there, and then outside of it is this big fluffy coat, and that co coat is so thick, and it's made up of such sort of innocuous molecules that our immune system doesn't recognize it very well, and in fact, it shields things like the invasion system we'll show you later. By expressing K capsule and O antigen uh, in, the right, in the right way, we can increase the serum half-life from less than five minutes for this population to more than four hours, which means that if I were to inject a wild-type bacterium into you which did not have this capsule system, it would be cleared from your, your blood very, very quickly and would not have time to find the tumor. And in order to make enough bacteria in your blood to find the tumor, I have to inject a, a heck of a lot of them. On the other hand, I can inject many fewer if they can live longer and have a higher chance of encountering the tumor itself. And so by doing that, by adding this capsule, I increase that half-life by, by a large fraction. Also, these different, uh, these different capsules are functionally additive, which is nice. Now, in order to make these capsules, there are organic molecules that are synthesized through a complicated pathway. And that pathway is encoded by a series of enzymes that add the different lipid groups on and the different polysaccharide groups on. And, uh, uh, and so if I knock this out, then they go, it goes away. If I add it to a cell, it makes it, more or less. So these are K1 and K92 by synthetic clusters. So our AND gate for the, for, for, for the, for the complement is going to function by splitting this operon in two, splitting these gene, gene things in two, and putting one under the control of one sensor and the other under the control of the other sensor. So only when both path, parts of the pathway are made do you get capsule, right? It's kind of cool, because I can do that for any number. I can break this into you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and so on. Different pieces which all have to integrate be on at the same time in order to get the capsule to be made. And so it's a very strong AND gate. Um, this, is just a, this just shows you how, how this is sort of built. There is these, this idea that 
we have this lipopolysaccharides on the outside. There's a polysaccharide la layer here. There's this outer membrane. And we're going to be building components on here in various ways. But these genes do or build these components in order on this, on this sort of uh, lipid, in the, in this lipid chain here. This is an example of one of them. So this is, this is for people who are, who are more biologically minded. This is an induction of capsule. Um, in this case, we have, a, we have a, a pathway which is being made in, uh, uh, in trans. We've knocked out one of the members in the middle there. Put that underneath a, a promoter that can be induced by this molecule in hydrotetracycline. And what you're seeing is that as we induce, we get more and more capsule. Now, that's what that band up there means. Okay? So we can turn on this system in trans like this. So we can start to make the end gate. Because now I can put this under control of a gal gene, for example, under control of tet. And only when both signals are present do they turn on. And I can start to characterize this part. And what synthetic biologists like to do is to take these parts, which we can prove biologically basically function, and begin to characterize them with enough detail that I can predict how they'll work in composite. And so here's an example just of our, this is just a, a, a TET promoter driving, uh, uh, driving um, uh, this component for capsule and getting this capsule-mediated uh, O16. And we can build this sort of transfer function for the, for the process. We know that's what the shape of the transfer function is. And we can show, in fact, that, that when, when we fully induce this capsule, that we are protected in, in serum. So we can, when, they're not, when, when the capsule is not induced, the bacteria die. When the capsule is induced, they can survive indefinitely in serum. So that's roughly where we stand with the complement AND gate, although we have these, these, these sensors. We have sensors for these things hooked up to it, and we can make them go. Now, controlling cell-cell interactions. One of the things which is really nifty about doing the next stage, which remember is dropping our shield, which will happen naturally when these conditions are not met, and then inducing cell invasion, and, uh, cell adhesion and invasion, is that this adhesion and invasion module that we've chosen is extremely simple. It's actually taken from an, a relative of, of black plague, or Yersinia pestis is plague. Uh, <laughs> this is Yersinia pseudotuberculosis, which is not very toxic to you. Um, but it has a protein on its surface called invasin, which is this long tube-like thing you see here. And you can take this protein and attach it to a styrofoam bead, and it will invade cells. It's pretty cool. And the way it works is it actually binds to a protein on the mammalian cell surface called beta-1 integrin that triggers an engulfment pro process. And beta-1 integrin, it turns out, is overexpressed on a large fraction of cancer cells that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, this was demonstrated in 87 by Stan Falco, actually. It's kind of cool. So all we have to do is express this protein on our surface, and our bacteria will bind to the cells and invade. Pretty simple. Now we have to make sure that it does it when we tell it to do it. Now how are we going to assay whether or not these cells invade? This is just an example of how you do a biological assay of this variety. You mix your bacteria with your target cells. You wait for an amount of time. You then dump an antibiotic on the mixed culture. And the antibiotic can't permeate the mammalian cells, so it'll kill all the bacteria left in the media. Then you take your, your mammalian cells and you lyse them and plate out their insides. You take all their insides and just dump them onto a petri dish. And then you count how many colonies of bacteria arise. And that will be the number of bacteria that were in that number of cells that you broke open and put on that plate. So we can talk about the fraction of bacteria recovered after this process. And these are a bunch of different tumor cell lines, which obviously aren't tumors or cell lines. This is a, a, um, a cervical carcinoma, um, very famous HeLa cells. This is osteosarcoma. This is a hepatosarcoma. These are um, breast uh, tumor cell lines, and this is a, a normal. There's no such thing as a normal cell line, but it's normal. And what's interesting about this is that if you just take E. coli K12, which is it's a normal one, versus R1 expressing invasin, no logic here then they can invade HeLa cells when they have invasin, but they can't when they don't, and so on and so forth. The interesting thing is they won't invade the normals. And the reason why is the normals don't have enough beta-1 beta integrin on their surface to mediate this interaction. So what are going to be our, our sensors? So one that we're going to use is a sensor for density. And the way that this works is, um, I'll look at my time here, uh, is we're going to use a quorum sensing system. Now, I'm going to lie to you a little bit here, and I'm going to say, gosh, I'm going to use this Vibrio Fischeri quorum sensing system. Now, it turns out that when we began to use that system, um, we didn't think too hard about it. And it turns out it works really great as a density sensor, but only in oxygen. Well, gosh, uh, we're looking for a low oxygen environment, and that won't work. 
turns out there are many other quorum sensing systems we can use, and, and it'll be equivalent. It's not, and they don't require oxygen. But this is a, a problem that we didn't think about when we were doing this design. The way it works is really nifty. It's actually used. The system is used by bacteria that live free in the ocean. And then when a baby octopus, a baby, a baby squid is born, it, uh, it, 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 it gets uh, transported into its light organs, which are little lens-like things on the, on, the, on the bottom of this fish or this, uh, this octopus. And when they get to a high cell density, they activate a light generating system. So that's why it's called Lux for light. And then this octopus uses it to uh, fool uh, bottom dwelling predators into thinking that they're not, they're, not, they're not casting a shadow, more or less. So they don't get eaten. It's kind of cool. Now, the way it works is the uh, bacterium has a system that makes a small molecule that gets exported from the cell, and then it gets re-imported. So if there's no other bacteria around, the small molecule that gets exported diffuses away very quickly, and you never can re-import it. Well, there's lots of bacteria around. This, this molecule becomes up to high concentration, and it's re-imported more quickly. And that re-imported molecule binds to a protein that activates a gene that causes a light to turn on. So it's called a quorum sensing system that senses density. Um, this is just an example. As, as a function of cell density, the light emission from, this, from, from the natural Vibrio fissurae goes like this. Nice, this is a log scale and a, and a linear scale, so it's a pretty nice strong turn on. We took this under control for invasion, so now we took, took this whole system, this Lux system, and instead of it being light that comes out, we're going to bring in invasion. Remember, we're using cell density because bacteria grow to 10 to the third higher density in tumor than any other tissue in your body. Okay? So we're going to set the threshold so that it, it turns on only at densities that occur in tumors. And here we have our construct here. And uh, uh, this, is our, this is our recovery assay. If, it's, if they are expressing invasion, invasion all the time, this is our maximal output, if you wish. And this is, as a function of cell density, our circuit here. And you can see we can turn on at sort of a critical value out here where suddenly we get invasion. And this is just the, this is just, we have a GFP downstream so we can watch these guys fluoresce also along that range. Now, that gives us the, the density sensor. We now need a low O2 sensor. And the way we found the low O2 sensor was by using microarray data. Now, it turns out that we were lucky in that in 2005, this guy Solomon et al., these people, Solomon et al., uh, did a microarray experiment on E. coli where they grew them in regular oxygen conditions and low oxygen conditions. And all we had to do was find the promoters that turned on extremely highly in low oxygen, right? And it turned out that FDHF changed 20-fold. Now, why didn't we use IADA, which is 23-fold? It's because this one, we had a lot more information about how it worked. So we took that guy. We took this fella, which is actually a formate-controlled uh, um, molecule. And under low oxygen, it will, in fact, um, uh, turn, it will turn on this, this promoter. Now, the problem is that when we did the same assay as we did for the cell density, by putting an invasin downstream here and then asked what fraction of invasion did we get as a function of O2, we found we had a constitutive on phenotype. Is, no matter what we did, whether, low, whether in low oxygen or high oxygen, we got invasion. And that's because of a mismatch. That the, invas the invasin is so sensitive that even a little bit of leak from this promoter, a little bit of current leak from that promoter, can be trans transmitted into a really strong invasion. So we had to do some engineering there. This is, this is one of the problems with doing biological engineering. We don't have a common currency. We don't have common signal standards. It's one of the things that synthetic biologists want to fix. Now, so if the output, so here's an example of, of, of an input-output system where here's our input. It can go between here and here. And the output here, just, it, you're just not making any output change in that region. And similarly, this could be too high, and it will always be out. So we're in this region over here. So what we're going to do is, since we can't rationally design this yet, because we don't have a way of sitting down and going, well, how should I change this promoter so that it would be exactly this input-output structure, we do it randomly, and we select for fellows who do it. Another advantage of synthetic biology is I can do evolutionary selections artificially in lab. And so what we did is, right over here, we inserted a library, a whole large number of different possibilities that would change the way of the number of proteins that exist per transcript. And then we could select in a clever way for those guys who met our input-output conditions. And when we did that, it was through a double selection. That is, first you take a bunch of guys to a mutant library. Each cell now has a different ver member of the library in it. And some of these guys may be expressing um, invasion, invasion in, uh, in, um, in anoxic conditions. 
and then those guys will invade. We get those guys, then we take these fellows and put them in high oxygen, and we only take the guys who don't invade in high oxygen. You see? So you select the guys who invade in low oxygen and don't invade in high oxygen, and that will select the library members who meet our input-output input, input criterion. Right? And when we did that, not only did we find a whole list of these interesting ribosome binding sites that we could use this way, we could get very strong behaviors. That is, we could get, this is our, uh, our uh, aerobic, this is uh, um, uh, under aer uh, anaerobic conditions, aerobic conditions, invasion. There's absolutely no invasion under aer aerobic conditions and very high invasion under anaerobic conditions. We've actually met that criterion. Finally, we have to build an AND gate. Now, so we have to take our, we have to take our two inputs. In this case, we're just a test system where we're using salicylate and arabidose, but we're going to use density and oxygen. It's the same, same transfer function here. And we have this AND gate here which is derived with something called suppression. Again, another biological trick. And the idea here is I take a protein who can activate the downstream gene. In this case, it will be GFP, but it can also be invasin. And I'm going to put into it two codons, two codes, that tell it that I'm a dead protein. That is, what's called a stop codon. And because these stop codons exist, when the ribosome tries to translate it, it stops and stops dead. Now, I can suppress that action by, create, by making a tRNA that can recognize that stop codon and allow the ribosome to move through it. And I can program how cooperative it is, how sigmoid the response is by changing the number of these sites. So if I express sub D, then T7 can express, and then this gene can express. But if sub D is not produced, then T7 will not be expressed, and I can't get GFP. So I need both this T7 being expressed and sub D to get output here. And this just shows how it looks as a function of, our t of two particular inputs, salicylate and arabinose. And you can see that only when both are high do we get an output here. It's not a perfect AND gate, but it's a pretty good AND gate. And this just shows, this is this flow cytometry to show the same data. And we can, fit, we can actually derive from first principles what we think that the, the, the transfer function for this device would be. And it has a, it's a function of the input one. It's a function of I2 squared because of the way that we've, we've derived these, 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 uh, these uh, stop codon sites. There's two of them. And it has a sort of you know, rational polynomial form. And if we take the data as a function of our inputs and plot them versus the model, it's pretty good and linear. So they, they really do line up pretty good. So now, intracellularly, we can do other things. And I'm not going to describe devices that we're, we have on the, on the board for this. I have to say that there's a bunch of ways that one can do this, and people have already shown it can be done. So once the bacteria ends up in the cell, by the invasive mechanism, it ends up in what's called the vacuole. The vacuole gets invaded by the lysosome, which changes the pH. And when this happens, you can either uh, uh, break open the cell and deliver, um, deliver protein fragments that get displayed on, on the surface of the cell that direct macrophage to kill it. Or you can break open the cell and leave plasmids in small molecules, which can uh, uh, then make protein and, um, and a plasmid, which can also be exposed on the surface or can deliver uh, chemistry. Or you can uh, actually in, uh, escape the vesicle and do things inside the cell, like grow and dump a kill, or move from cell to cell. So in all these cases, we have different designs for each one of these situations, and we're testing each one to see whether or not it will work, though we're not, we're not quite there yet. So the other thing we have to engineer in is safety, just to give you some sense of what we're thinking about. So safety is an example uh, of something that's incredibly important in this case. And the way we're going to do it here, or one of the ways we're going to do it, is to remove the ability of this bacterium to actually make a core critical component, which is the peptidoglycan layer that makes it rigid and flexural. By doing that, what we're going to do is remove this, this pathway that allows it to make this intermediate. By removing those many genes, we know it can't make this this metabolite, and we know that in the body this metabolite does not exist, so we can't get it from the outside. So only if we feed the bugs this metabolite will they grow. Here's an example of an invasion assay with a bug which has been knocked out for this pathway where we don't feed it the metabolite, and you can see that it can't do anything, and actually we don't get any bugs back. Whereas when we add the metabolite, it can survive inside these cells for a while. So the idea is to link it to a, a, a metabolite that you can eat that these guys will need and be able to process. OK, so we're here, we're here, this is sort of the end of summing up here. Minimizing risk. We're going to make metabol metabolic dependencies. We, we can give it antibiotic sensitivities, make it sensitive to certain antibiotics we can take. 
We're also going to change, we've also been, been initiating a program to delete hypermutation genes, delete recombinases, delete phage receptive genes, and many restriction enzymes to prevent mutation and recombination. We're going to try to build, we're still, still trying to build addiction modules for presenting gene loss. We don't get diffusion away from our designs. And George Church and Pete Schultz have been working on changing the genetic code so that there's incompatibility of our DNA with, other, with, the, with the outside bacteria, and, there's, and the outside bacteria's DNA doesn't work in our cell. So there's no DNA interchange safety issues. And we want to make designs fragile to mutation so there's a soft failure. That is, that when they do mutate, they completely remove the function and don't misfire, something we don't, we don't want to, to happen. We have to deal with things like controlled containment, license use, and, license use and signature on designs, but this is sort of more policy than anything else. So here's our challenges. We've been trying to meet the challenges of specificity of function, of preservation of function, and engineering for safety. Um, these are the challenges, I think, that synthetic biology faces, and this is a good test bed for doing that. We're just beginning, however. People have been going into mice and doing this for a while, but trying to do it from a piecewise point of view in a scalable way where the pieces can be reused and, re and repurposed is something that haven't been done before. So each of, these, each of these things we've been doing has challenged our ability to understand you know, how do you engineer robustness and sensitivity? How do you engineer against evolution? How do you quantify parts and, and, and their dynamics and their phenotype? And how do we build this critical synthetic biology application? Now, I want to end with one thing. One of the things that we really, really lack here are the tools that allow us to synthesize biological networks the way we synthesize, we synthesize uh, cellular networks. We just don't have those tools. The information management systems, we don't have the data analysis systems, and we don't have the repository of parts and characterize, characterizations that make this feasible. And I think it's really important that we do this because if you look at, I won't go through this engineering analogy here, but I will talk about the scaling. This is a famous, these are the famous Moore-like curves where you say, well, gosh, you know, the number of sequences in GenBank is growing super exponentially. This is a, 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 sl a slide to, the, to Rob Car Carlson where this is the number of transistors per chip here going up as a function of time. This is the number of sequencing reactions going up per time. And this is the number of DNA bases being sequenced per person per year. The point is that we're going to rapidly cross all these other curves with synthesis. And if we're building systems, if we can synthesize whole things like viruses, we have to have in our minds how they should be designed, how we can design them safely, and how we can do that in a scalable and efficient way. OK. So uh, with that, I'm going to stop, and I'm going to talk about all this stuff. And uh, acknowledge uh, uh, Chris Anderson, who did all of the tumor killing bacteria work, with some help with Elizabeth Clark from Chris Voigt's lab, and of course with Chris Voigt, who's our, who's our close collaborator. Um, and with that, I'll stop and take questions. Thank you. Okay, we'd like to thank uh, Professor Arkin for taking time to come over here and speak to us. Um, we're short of time, so if there are any questions, we'll take uh, one question. Yeah, great talk, Adams. And what is the lifetime of this E. coli inside of this, the, the body? What is the lifetime inside the body? Mm -hmm. So if you just take E. coli K12 and you put it into a mouse, uh, the, the half-life of a population in the mouse itself is about uh, five minutes. Five minutes. But, but when you add o, uh, o antigen control and K capsule control, it's over four hours. So, but it, it takes two, two days to accumulate inside of the cancer site, right? No, no, it takes two days to grow inside the tumor cell, right? Uh, localization occurs within, within that first 20 minutes because it goes everywhere in the mouse in 20 minutes, right? It's just that, uh, just that to see the colony grow inside the tumor, it takes two days. Um, okay, well, so we're, we're going to have to end. Uh, I'm sure that Professor Arkin would be more than happy to take any more questions after. I just wanted to remind you that next week is the last research exchange uh, before the end of the semester. And if you